we're going to be studying about uh, this, this pillar uh, as we're in this series, Divine Pillars to Build On. Last week we were building on the name of Jesus. God said if you're going to go higher, you got to go deeper. If the building that he's going to build up in you is going to do greater, it's got to have a greater foundation. So we're doing this series on our foundations and the pillars that we build on. And we were looking at the name of Jesus. We can cast out devils in the name of Jesus. We can lay hands on the sick, see them recover in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the lame can walk, the deaf can talk. The, I mean, yes, the dumb can talk, the deaf can hear, the blind can see. Praise God. There's great, great, great power in the name of Jesus. Every knee has to bow in heaven on earth and even under the earth to the name of Jesus and declare he is Lord. So there's power in the name of Jesus. You don't forget that. What we're learning here is not something that we just sit in the back of our mind. What we study here is to transform our lives so that we go into the rest of this day and into this week transformed into the likeness of Christ, moving and living in the power of His anointing and fulfilling His will for our life. So today we're going to follow in this series looking at divine pillars to build on and we're going to be looking at the Word of God. And I know I'm here with all confidence to tell you that I know that the King of kings and the Lord of lords has sent me here today. He is the one that saved me. He's the one that made me to be a king and a priest unto God as he's made you to be a king and a priest unto God. And I come in his name, that name that is above every name, and I declare to you he is not a way. He is the way. You hear me? He is not gaining victory. He is the victory. Praise God. And the princes of this world have been defeated. The enemy has been abolished. And the power has been broken. And the lordship of Jesus Christ is certain. I come in his name. And I come in his power. And I come to bring to you today, to your attention and my attention, the value, the importance, and the power that we have in and through the word of God. Hallelujah. And I speak to Christian Embassy International Church here local and to everyone who is tuned in across the world. I speak to you as we are a Christ-centered church. We are a Holy Spirit-empowered church. We are a devil-defeating, demon-destroying church. I hope somebody would join with me. We are a victorious church. We are an invading church. We are a triumphant church. We are a church with momentum. We are a church with vision. We are made up and redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of this church. And therefore I declare no weapon. I say no weapon, no mountain, no storm, no barrier, no obstacle, no problem can stop the body of believers as Jesus Christ is our head and he leads us from victory to victory. Somebody say amen. 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 See, God did not spare any cost to empower us to accomplish his will. Let me say that again. He spared no cost to empower us so that we might accomplish his will. I pray every day as I get up, I pray, my Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I take some time to meditate on his name and remember the power of his name and the simplicity, but yet the authority that comes in his name. He is Jehovah Jireh. He's my God, my provider. He is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. He is Jehovah Rapha, my God, my healer, Jehovah Shalom, a God that will give me peace this day that surpasses all understanding, a peace that ushers in a joy of the Lord which will be my strength. Hallelujah. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I have to first off say, God, not my will today, not building up my kingdom. I don't need my fingerprints on it. I'm here to give you my hands to build up your kingdom and to accomplish your will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then I pray for God to give me this day my daily bread. I'm not worried about tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. I'm concerned about honoring him today. I'm concerned about the 
bread of life that I need today to do today's duty. Hallelujah. And then I pray for that bread to be given to me. And then I've got to ask God for forgiveness because I'm not like all of you that are perfect in every way. I still have a flaw or two and I have to ask for forgiveness. So I ask God to forgive me, which then he reminds me he will only do if I forgive those who have sinned against me. So I've got to make sure I'm releasing everybody who sinned against me, everybody who's poked me the wrong way, everybody who's said something to try and jab or something done to my family, I've got to release it, let it go, forgive them so I can receive the forgiveness of God. So forgive me today, Lord God, my sin, as I forgive those who've sinned against me. And God, lead me away from temptation. I'm like, Lord, I'm going to follow you today. You're not going to lead me into temptation. You're going to lead me away from temptation and you're going to deliver me from evil. See, I get a daily, a daily shower, but I also, not only a physical shower, I get a spiritual shower. I do a daily deliverance every day. I'm not one of those preachers or Christians who says, I'm so holy and I'm just so this that the devil forgot to even mess with me. I know that I'm on the cutting edge. I'm in war. There's blood and guts that I'm tearing through as I'm leading forth the army of the Lord. There's sweat and battle and there's dirt and grime and there's demons that I'm fighting with. And, you know, as Paul said, he was vexed on every side. I'm telling you, uh, uh, my shield of faith goes up. Those fiery darts come in and explode on the, fire, uh, on the shield, but they don't get to me. But there's a, some, some dust that's left over from it, some demonic uh, residue. I need a daily deliverance. God, deliver me. Deliver me from evil. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, and, and then I pray, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. It's all about your kingdom, your glory, and, uh, and amen. That's the way to get up. That's the way to go. Because let me tell you what, God spared no cost to empower us to accomplish his will. And I need to get up every day, and I need to get dressed for battle, and I need to fulfill his will just like you do. And that's why... We need the Word of God, the instruction manual of God. Because, let me tell you what, the enemy is truly fighting against the church of God. He's not fighting against atheists. He's not fighting against uh, those that are thugs and want to do nothing but bring destruction and death and theft. You know, that's not who the devil's fighting. Man, he's got them in his posse. He doesn't need to be fighting against them. He's feeding their drug addiction so they can keep on doing it. He's feeding their lust addiction so they can keep on doing it. But uh, it's fighting against the children of God, the army of Christ. Hallelujah. So we, we must come in agreement with the word of God because I, I just prophesy that the persecution and the challenges against you will be overcome by the Holy Ghost power that is in you. Now, if you're denying the Holy Spirit, you're in trouble. If you're trying to fight the devil in your own strength, you're in trouble. If you've let some denomination talk you out of the Holy Ghost or scare you about the Holy Ghost, you're in trouble. But we're here to enlighten you and bring you the truth of God's Word that He birthed this church with the infilling of the Holy Spirit that brought power from heaven to overcome. And if that's how God started it, that's how God's going to continue it. We need the Holy Spirit of God. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. We need to be empowered by the Spirit of God. So I prophesy again. I say unto you that the persecution and the challenges that are coming against you are going to be overcome by the Holy Ghost power that is in you. In Jesus' name. And oh, how we need the Word. It is the divinely inspired, it is the Holy Spirit-led power of God, infused life of God, revealed a, 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 a supernatural book that God has given us. There's no other book in all of the world like this book. When you open up this book, you're opening up into the very heartbeat of God. Thump, thump, thump. The breath of God. The will of God, the wisdom of God, the life of God, the spirit of God, the knowledge of God, the, the desire of God, the power of God. We get it all in the word of God. Hallelujah. He said in Hebrews 4 and 12, for my word, the word of God is living and it's active. This isn't some dead, stale book. You may have had churches that went religious that look at this as some dusty book that, that has formulas in it and magic power. But I'm here to tell you, none of that is true. This is alive. It is the living, active word of God, sharper than a double-edged sword. The Bible says, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of man. This is God in us. When we get this in us, we get God in us. The Bible said our mind is renewed by the Word of God. We are transformed, not being molded into the image of this world, but transformed into the metamorphosis of who God has created us to be by the Word of God. We need the Word of God. We need to trust the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to memorize the Word of God. We need to speak the Word of God. Hallelujah. It is a lie. Praise His name. See, the Word of God is more than the text on the page. It is the living, active force of God that shapes and molds our lives. And if you leave it dusty on a shelf, your life is going to be dusty. If you leave it sitting as a form on the shelf, your life is going to be but a form that the devil can take over. But I'm telling you, there's marching orders in this book. There's the victory plan of God. God has never lost a battle and never will. God has never started something he didn't finish. If you want to win, get in the Word and get the Word in you. You want to finish well, get in the Word and get the Word in you. And yes, there's a real devil. Yes, he is. But Jesus said, all you need is the word. Let me show you. In Matthew 4 and 4, you remember when Jesus himself was being tempted in the wilderness. He said unto Satan, he said unto him, it is written. It is written. He went to the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that word, uh, the zozo, is from zo zoe, that life zoe, where Jesus said in John 10 and 10, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come to give you life, zoe, life, and life more abundant. This here is that same word he's saying. He said you must live by the bread, not by bread alone, but by every word. There's a zoe life. There's an abundant life. There's a victorious life. There's a devil-crushing uh, 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 and devil, de demon defeating life, you can live by the word of God. And believe you me, Satan understood what he said because it was with the word that Satan was rebuked every time in that temptation experience. That's why I believe that Paul tells us in 2 Timothy as he's writing to this young pastor and he's writing to this church and he's writing to us all Scripture, not just part of it. Don't you just pick and mix and, oh, well, I like this one, but I don't like it. No, all of it is given by the inspiration of God, the breath of God. Hallelujah. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, why? So that the man of God, the woman of God may be complete. If there's any incompletion in your life today, the Word of God will take care of it. If there's something in your life that is not yet measured up, I'm telling you the Word of God will take it up. It will make you the man, the woman of God, complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he tells us, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of God. A worker who does not be, need to be ashamed. Now, he's not talking about a worker that's working for salvation. He's talking about we who are saved that is doing what God has called us to do. He's gifted and talented every one of us to be in the marketplace and to be in the ministry of some sort. Every one of us in our home, in our relationships, in our sphere of influence. And he says, you will be equipped. You will be equipped by the word. You will present yourself approved to God. You'll be handling the talents correctly. You'll be handling your investments correctly. You'll be handling your friendships correctly. You'll be handling your uh, marriage correctly. You'll be handling your children, your relationship with your parents correctly because the worker is doing what God has called us to do. We don't need to be ashamed because the word of truth will give us what we need. So I say it with conviction. We need the word. We need the word. See, the Word portrays Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. See, beneath uh, the Bible, behind the Bible, above and beyond the Bible is the God of the Bible. Don't make that disconnect. This is God's breath, God's wisdom, God's presence to us. And God's Word was written uh, at, at, of His will revealed through man. And the central theme is salvation, thoroughness, being made whole through Jesus Christ, being sozo, salvation in every area made whole. See, the Bible contains, I didn't know if you knew this or not, it has 66 books and there are 40 different authors of the Bible 
who the author, the Holy Spirit, worked through, and it covers 160 approximately years. So most of them never knew each other, some of them even 1,600 years apart, but there's one book, one theme, one history, and it's his story, the story of redemption. Hallelujah. So behind a thousand events stands God, the builder of history and the maker of the ages. Between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation, we see this thing called time. Those, those, all that time is represented. And, and all through the time that God is uh, in the minutest detail working this one purpose, one purpose for mankind, and it's the design of Almighty God that was ruined and wrecked in the Garden of Eden, but God came to redeem and restore and bring us back into relationship and empowerment with Him. This book threatens leaders and authorities who stand against God. Study history. Study history, and you will find the one book that has come under more attack from millennial to millennia was, is the Bible, the Word of God. Even today, the Word of God. The enemy is afraid of you opening your Bible. The, the enemy is afraid of you getting in the Word because he's afraid the Word will get in you. He's afraid of that. Now, you're going to neglect it when you know that the enemy of your soul, the enemy that wants to destroy your children, destroy your family, destroy your health, destroy your wealth, that the one thing he doesn't want you to get into is the Word. And you're just going to casually let it lie? Let me tell you a story. Back about 20, I'm guessing, going on 28 years ago. Not in this pulpit, but the pulpit of our church in the chapel. There stood, uh, I had a preacher preaching. And he got up and he started preaching about the importance of the Word of God. He was from another country, had a real strong accent. And he didn't know this, but I love Bibles. I love Bibles. I love the languages of the Bible. I love Hebrew. I love Aramaic. I love Greek. I love Latin, the Latin Vulgate. I love studying the Scripture and its languages. And he's talking about the Bible, and, and, and he didn't know that I collect Bibles. I like real old Bibles. And he pulled out this particular Bible, if I can get it out of here. And he pulled this Bible out. And he said, let me tell you a little story about this Bible. He said, this Bible comes from another country, the country I'm from. And uh, let me tell you how it came about being here today. He said, there was a ministry, International Samaritan Health and Aid. And this ministry would use blue bag uh, medical supplies, which means hospitals, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to, if you went in the hospital and they opened a case of a 24-pack whatever for you and each is sealed individually in that sealed case, if they just used one of those sealed items, they charged your insurance company for the whole thing. So legally, they could not use the other 23 sealed individual packets because you were charged for the whole thing even though you only used one. So they would blue bag it, meaning it was not dangerous, it was not hazardous, but they had to throw it away. Well, we were with this company, with this ministry that learned that and made a deal with them that we'll pick up all your blue bags. We had a warehouse in Portsmouth and we would sort the medical supplies and package them uh, and send them to other countries, specifically this country, because this leader of that ministry had been there and their number one cry was, please get us Bibles. Why? Because the dictator of that country was afraid of the Word of God. I wish I could get some Christians as confident of the power of the Word of God as dictators are afraid of the power of the Word of God. So this dictator didn't care if you read Moby Dick. He didn't care if you read any other novel. He didn't care. But he did not want his people reading the Bible. He said, we are atheists. There is no God. And if I can truly, with propaganda, get these people to believe this, that I am basically their God, then I can rule anything and get anything I want. So he put out a, a decree and a law that this country 
could not legally own a Bible. Or you could own one that was state approved, <laughs> that had been printed as that story, folklore, but the, here's the country and our dictator and how great he is. He's the one that's fulfilling the folklore, whatever. They could have those, but they couldn't have the Bible. So he said, two ways we're going to get rid of the Bible. This is the law. You can either burn your Bible, and if we come in and investigate and we find a Bible, you're going to jail. So you can burn your Bible. We'll have cor corporate burning spots as well. Or you can turn your Bibles in, and we will shred them up and make them into toilet paper. And every time someone wipes their rear, they can be reminded of just how awesome that God was. Yeah, right. He was nothing but waste. So that's the law. And people were greatly fear, feared of this uh, uh, tyrant. And he was getting worse and worse over the years. And so people didn't have a Bible. Well, this particular ministry leader was in that country. And he heard the cry of the people saying, we need Bibles. Our Bibles are gone. So what we did, we partnered with him and we would print these little uh, Gideon Bibles with the Psalm and the Proverbs and the New Testament in the language of that country. And we would hide them by the thousands under these medical supplies and send them into this country. This gentleman had, uh, through uh, divine uh, uh, providence, the Lord had hooked him up with an underground church. This underground church would host him when he would come in. They would give him the request to come and bring the medical supplies. And uh, we'd get through customs and they didn't realize underneath were all these Bibles. And this house would then distribute the Bibles. Now the father of this house was the pastor of this underground church. And, um, and they would hold prayer meetings there and Bible study with what they could remember or a Bible that they were hiding. Uh, and uh, others would just come and listen. And soldiers had raided the house. And there had been lots of legal problems. But then it got to the place uh, soldiers started changing into casual clothes and coming to the prayer meeting. And they said, don't we recognize you being the one that was out there patrolling? And he says, I'm a convert. Why are you a convert? Well, we came to raid your house and there were these great big angels or, or these great big people that were standing at the gate of your house and they frightened us and we were, wouldn't come in because we'd never seen anybody that big. And then I got to realize that must be an angel of God. I need to get, this is real. What these people are doing is real. I need to come in. So he's a pastor of this underground church and his wife is the little busybody evangelist. She, she goes under, she has got that uh, clarestine uh, a way she carried herself, a little innocent European lady that would just only bake you bread. You would think she's so innocent. But she had her purse filled with these Bibles. And she was in the tram station and she's getting these swords into people's hands. And one day she's at the tram station sitting on a bench waiting on the tram to come. And she's got this drunk that comes and sits beside her. He must have drank all night. He's a smelling really rough and carrying on. And she's like, well, you know, he needs the Lord. So she starts talking to him about the Lord. And then she says, here, you need a Bible. And she you know, slips out of her purse one of these little Gideon Bibles. And he starts laughing. Ha, ha, ha. You think that's a Bible? I have a Bible ten times the size of that Bible. And she's like, there's no way you got a Bible that survived all that we've gone through that's that big. And he said, yes, I do. I'll prove it to you. I, this isn't drunk talk. I'll be here tomorrow sober, and I'll bring it, and I'll give you, I, I, and then I'll take your little Bible. So the next day, she's going to work, and she has her little purse stashed with her swords, and then she's, there he comes, and he's sober. And he has a, a paper bag, and he sits down, and they start talking, and he said, here, I want to slip and show you something. And they're hiding and looking and he pulls this out and shows her he said here's my bible our family my and he talks about there was pastors generations before him he's definitely one of those pkks preachers kids 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 that have gone off track we declare that in the name of jesus that will never be in this house hallelujah and um, so he says yeah we've hidden it in the coals we've put it in plastic we we've been able to preserve it we tried to save the pages not knowing that there would ever be another Bible. So instead of opening it and destroying the pages, we just kiss it to show God that we still appreciate it. And the acid from their lips have just burnt 
the, the leather there. That's why you see that spot there. And uh, so he says, you're such a bold woman. You remind me of my family. You're such a bold woman. I'll give you this Bible for that little Bible. And he swapped with her right there. Well, then uh, several years later, uh, uh, the revolution took place in that country. And guess what? The people are marching down the uh, streets. Uh, believe it or not, this household I'm talking about was Pastor Rodica's household. This was her brother, the pastor, that's telling me about the Bible. They tell me they're going to give me the Bible because we'd just gotten engaged. I, I'm sitting there lusting after it, thinking, oh, my goodness, I collect Bibles. I would love to have that Bible. And he said, we're going to give it to Tim. I just started crying. I'm like, Lord, forgive me for coveting, but I tell you what, I couldn't help but get caught up. And, um, and now uh, seven of the eight siblings are in America. The eighth one, uh, uh, he, Abraham, got killed trying to escape a month before the revolution. But the revolution took place. Believe it or not, Pastor Radika was washing windows, she says. She says she was washing windows. I don't know if you ever washed windows since. I don't know. Never. (laughs) I'm just joking. She was a little tough on you up here, so I'm going to help you guys out. I'm free. But she was washing windows, and all of a sudden, they come walking down the street, and they have the Romanian flag with the hammer and the sickle cut out of it, draped over their bodies, marching down the street, worshiping God. And those Bibles, those Bibles that Sabina Patra had been passing out had become the Bibles that gave people the word, the understanding, the freedom, the authority to rise up. And the revolution took place because Christians got out of their hiding place because the word of God came to them. And I'm here to tell you today, this isn't something we're just talking about. This is reality. This is reality. This word that we neglect, this word that we don't read, this word that we ignore is so powerful. It will set nations free. Do you hear what I'm saying? How much more will it set you free? How much more will it set your family free? How much more will it set your health free? Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. So I'm not going to let a dictator believe more in the power of the Word of God than me, a believer. I'm not going to let a dictator do more effort to do away with the Word of God than I will exercise effort to, uh, uh, to preach the Word of God, study the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God. The Word of God. Let me give you reasons why the Bible is a divine pillar to build on. I'm going to convince you before you leave here. Some of you, you still not convinced. I'm going to convince you. I got a, I got a crowbar. I'm going, to, I'm going to pry you up out of your seat. I'm going to pry you up out of your coldness. I'm going to pry you out of your doubt. I'm going to pry you out of your misconception of the Bible. And you're going to leave here saying, I'm welding the sword, wielding the sword of the Spirit as I go out of here. So let me give you some reasons why it is a divine pillar that we need to build on. First, the Word of God gives us the wisdom of God. So y'all are here at my desk and I'm writing why build here, why build on this foundation of the Word of God, why it is the wisdom of God. So if I want to have the wisdom of God, I have access to it. A lot of people want to come hang with me. They, they didn't want to hang with me when I was hanging wallpaper, digging ditches for plumbers and electricians and, and doing all this side work to try and pay my bills and keep my minimum of my credit card paid, uh, which was a hard thing to do. And it was going to take me 723 years to get it paid off, paying the minimum like that. Not, not really, but it seemed like that long. And uh, so nobody really wanted to hang with me because they didn't like, there ain't much there I, I want to learn from. But as I started listening to the wisdom of God and using and employing the wisdom of God, I, I began to rise. I began to be built up in a way that I can't explain. And now everybody wants to hang around me and they're like, well, well, well Pastor Tim, if you could talk to your 17-year-old self, what would you tell your 17-year-old self now? And I would say, get in the Word. 
you, I needed to get in the Word. Back then, I just knew about the Word, but I needed to get in the Word because you get the wisdom of God. You don't need my wisdom. My wisdom is flawed at best. But I'm here to tell you the wisdom of God is perfect. The wisdom of God will never fail. The wisdom of God will stand the test of time. The sun, the moon, and the stars will fall from the sky, but the Word of God will still stand. The wisdom of God will still stand. Economies can collapse, but if you're building on the Word of God, you're not going down. What, what, what everybody else's loss is going to be your gain. What the enemy means for evil is going to be turned for good. Do you hear what I'm saying? We serve a supernatural God. Hallelujah. So we have access to the wisdom of God. Wisdom. He said in Deuteronomy 4 and 6, he told his people, God speaking to us, for this is your wisdom. He's talking about his word. He said, I give you my word. This is your wisdom and your understanding. He said in Proverbs 2 and 6, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. You want to know how to build a business? Build it on the word. You want to know how to have a successful family? Build it on the word. You want to know how to have a healthy body? Build it on the word. You want to know how to have a healthy mind? Build it on the word. Do you get what I'm trying to say? If you want anything good and lasting, build it on the word, which is the wisdom of God. God's wisdom. And then the second reason we would build upon the Word is because it's the love book of the universe. We were created in relationship to be uh, in relationship with God and to be in relationship with one another. And the enemy fights that. He attacks that root cause of connection more than anything else. He wants you to be at odds with your spouse. He wants you to be at odds with your parents. He wants you to be at odds with your children. He wants you to be at odds with your pastors. He wants you to be at odds with your friends. He wants you to be at odds with your co-workers. That is a strategy of the enemy. Why? Because God is love. God is love. And God has given us the book, the love book of the universe and how to operate in these relationships first and foremost with a relationship with Him. So God so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son. So much so in 1 John, He says, by this we know love because He laid His life down for us. It was a love act from heaven to earth that proved to us, shows to us, demonstrates to us what love is in the sacrifice there. So love is not a feeling. There is a loving feeling, but it can be fleeting. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody of you bold enough with your spouse sitting next to you to say years, a hundred years ago, I thought I was in love with somebody else, but I'm so glad it was just a fleeting feeling. I'm glad I didn't go that route. There's four of you that's honest. The rest of you... Long, 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 yeah, 100 years, at least 100 years, yeah, before your spouse was born, yeah. See, I can say that. (laughs) Any of you knew what I'm talking about? Praise God. I am truly the elder in our home, and I'll leave it at that. I got past Radica by a few years. He said, what in the world were you waiting on? And Pastor Radik said, he was waiting on me to grow up. (laughs) Okay, back. The love, the love. Whew. Another reason we want to build on the Word of God is because it's the book of order. Now, some of you say, well, I don't like order. I'm glad coming here this morning, everybody drove on the right side of the road. That's order. There's a few that's gotten over on my lane before and, and tried to play chicken with me. I don't know where their mind was, but I didn't think about it. if you're on the interstate and everybody's driving and you're, and you're doing this and they're just coming at you and you think you're going to merge, you move right and they're going to move left and then head on. You think about the chaos just in our driving. I'm glad there's order in growing food and preparing food. Can you imagine going in, in, at home or in a restaurant and they throwing you this plate and there's peas and carrots and rice and biscuits and, and uh, uh, chicken and steak and, and, and appetizers and sa- salad and all. And it's just all mixed together. I know some of you ate that last night, but just think if that was the norm. There's order there. 
I'll keep my rice and gravy over here and I'll, I'll keep my biscuit. If I want some gravy on it, I may want to save some of it for some jelly, you know, or some, some honey or some molasses or something like that. But don't just scramble it all up. I like order. I'm glad that Brother Marty has worked so hard to help with his volunteers and getting our seats here and getting the ACs on and getting the lights on. Then there's an order that or otherwise we'd be on top of each other. It'd be crazy, crazy. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They were without form and they were void and there was darkness on the face of the deep. And the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, it was good. He divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. So we see his order the first day, day and night. The second day, the heavens, he splits them up. The third day, the earth, the sea, and the seed-bearing plants and trees he creates. The fourth day, the sun, the moon, the stars, they serve as lights and signs and seasons. I'm glad there's an order. I'm glad that the fall season is coming with the crispness in the air. I'm glad that I know you can't stop it. You can protest, won't help. You can stop giving money to the church or the government or the meteorologists or whoever. You, they can't help you. You're not going to stop the seasons of God. There's an order he has. So we learn to go with him in his order. Otherwise, we're wearing uh, 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 overcoats and, and, and hats and uh, mittens and gloves and, and, and earmuffs in the middle of the summer and we die of heat stroke. We, we move with the order of what he has. Then on the fifth day, he created the sea life and the birds to multiply and be fruitful. And the sixth day, animals and crawling creatures. And he created man to subdue the earth and, and to rule over all things. And then on the seventh day, he rested as his work was complete. See, God is all about order. And he shows us how to order our lives. There's a way to, in the word, he will show you how to order your family in a godly way. Boy's getting quiet. I know, do my kids here? I know Caleb's filming. He's right here. I know Morgan's right here. Townsend's probably up here. Okay, so I got a witness and they can call me down. You have freedom to call me down. Your dad is flawed. Amen? 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 Okay, just so y'all know, I am flawed. But as a flawed man, I have gone to the book of order to trying to find out how to raise a family, a godly family. Because I didn't know. I didn't receive it growing up. I didn't witness it anywhere. But I had access. I couldn't blame. Well, my mama, my daddy, I'm, I'm grandma, I'm grandma. I can't blame well, society, the neighborhood. I can't blame. I can't blame because I had access... To the divine book of order. And as I got in this book and began to uh, uh, implement it in my family, praying that preacher's kids, can you imagine? Preacher's kids get the bad rap, PKs. They're always the rebellious wild ones. We rebuke and resist that because it's not true. But that's what we were told. And you're going to have wild children. People say, oh, you're going to have wild children. I'm glad you got a good wife because you have wild kids. I'm like, boy, you're encouraging. And, uh, and then Townsend was coming out. He started wiggling and moving and causing things to happen. He was coming out uh, on Halloween. And I told Pastor Rodica, I said, we got to stand you on your head. We got to do something. This PK can't be born on Halloween. Because I thought it had something to do with the environment out here. And she said, stand on my head. I said, slow those contractions down, girl, because this can't be a Halloween baby. Nothing wrong with you being born on Halloween, but PK, come on now. Thank God, after midnight, November 1st, I was okay. And he was born November 1st. Thank you, Lord. But I thought the external environment was going to shape or mold him uh, more than I had the, impa- the, part, the part of molding him. And then it didn't matter if he was born on Halloween. That was just another day. But back then, I didn't know. But now I've got this little thing that I'm responsible for, 
And I've been responsible for a church. I went to the Word for how to build a church. And I'm responsible as a husband. I went to the Word and how to be responsible as a husband. So I quickly ran it because they didn't give me a manual at Chesapeake General. They just, within 24 hours, booted us out. And I'm like, you mean I got that? You mean I got to take this home? What, anybody coming home with me? No. So I had to get into the manual, the book of order, to learn how. And I would say today, not for my benefit, but to God be the glory, the book works. The book works. I have three children filled with the Holy Ghost, have a calling on their life, and they pursue it not because mom or dad are pushing them. It's because they're telling us what God is saying to them through their relationship with Him. Hallelujah. The book works. The book works. Fourth, we build on it because it reveals the laws of the universe. The law of the seed, the law of work, the law of miracles, the law of harvest, the law of love, the law of process, the law of reciprocity, the law of truth, all the laws of God, we learn how to work them. See, I use those laws in my business. I use those laws in this church. I use those laws in my family. I use those laws in my friendship. And they all are successful, not because I'm that smart, but I'm smart enough to use the laws of God. Hallelujah. What an awesome God. And anytime there's one law of reciprocity, he said, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Anytime we have a, another venture we want to do and we need excess for it, we give more. And you're like, wait a minute, how do you go for a new venture that you feel like God's leading to you by giving to the church more? Because of the law of reciprocity. And some people say, you never give to get. Well, why would God say, when you give, no, get ready. I'm giving it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. He's talking about a basket. You need to get your basket ready. Now, do I give to get? No, I give because the celebration is I'm giving into the kingdom work of God and that work is going to do eternal work that I'll get rewards for throughout eternity for the lives that it's impacted. But the natural benefit because of the law of God is that he's going to bless me because my business belongs to him. This venture is something he wants. It's not for greed or materialism. It's to advance the kingdom of God. So the laws of God work. You don't believe the law of gravity works? Come up here and... And just lay back. I dare you. Just come here and just lay back. <laughs> Anybody? Any takers? Any takers? You want to just come here and let me push you. Just say, push me. <laughs> gravity, law of gravity works. All the laws of God work. And the Bible reveals the laws of God. Hallelujah. Fifth, the Word of God is a relationship handbook. Some of you have been ignoring that section. Oh, my goodness, you got some chaos and some relationships. They are jank. Mm -hmm. What's some of the terminology? They are jacked up. What? Y'all getting all shy? Y'all always talking that language I don't understand. Lane, you got it? No? Don, got it? My goodness, I, they, I know how to make them mute. When they're over at the house at 12 o'clock one night all talking, I'm just going to start asking them questions like this and get them mute again. Okay. <laughs> it's a relationship handbook. It exposes the acts of the enemy and what to do and what not to do in relationships. And no matter if it's your relationship with your children, with your parents, with your spouse, with your friends, with your coworkers. It's also a worship encyclopedia. Now, I don't need to say a whole lot of here because Pastor Radika came up here with her, her little uh, Nerf bat. She acts all tough. Let me tell you guys, she got a heart bigger than Texas. When she's wielding a bat, like she's going to beat y'all up because y'all just whatever. She said, it's a Nerf bat. Let her, let, ask the kids. Morgan, if she spanked you one time and what did she use? A feather duster. <laughs> I'm telling you, she's tough, man, scary Romanian. I'll beat you up, feather duster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's a worship encyclopedia. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And everything she said was right. He says that, that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. We're to come before his presence with singing. 
That's why we start singing. That's why I get up in the morning singing. Why? Because he says, this is how I've read the book. And here is the encyclopedia of worship. This is what God likes. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please him. I'm not here to be a professional sound to make your ears go, ooh, I like that. Uh, Let's put them on, you know, what's one of those shows, voice or something like that. No, I'm here to please him. And he said, I can make a joyful noise unto him. Somebody get, get on with the program now. God says, come before my presence with singing. He also says, I inhabit the praises of my people. That word inhabits means uh, yashab. It's the Hebrew word. It means I move in with covenant power, covenant provision, covenant uh, anointing, whatever you need. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. You wanted me in a special way. I'm here. You wanted my attention. You got my attention. How? When we worship him, he inhabits the praises of his people. Hallelujah. We also see that we build upon the Word of God because it teaches spiritual protocol. It it reveals the appropriate conduct necessary in approaching God effectively. I tell you, some people come to me and I'm not God, but I'm created in the image of God. So I've got some likeness of Him, right? And I'm being made made and renewed and, and morphed into that image more and more every day. How many of you would like somebody to come up to you and grab you by the collar, yank you up close to them with stink breath and tell you how displeased they are of you or they wanted such and such and and they wanted you to do that you never even knew they wanted to do and then say, you know, uh, you know, this is this is we're friends. We're best friends. You, You don't want to hang with people like that. Sometimes how we come to God with our stink breath. And we just yank on him. God, I need so-and-so. God, if you'll do so-and-so, then I'll do so-and-so. Who are you to be negotiating from that point of view? The very breath that you breathe, he gives to you. Do you not understand that? The very sight, if you have sight in your eyes, comes from him. The very sound in your ears that you can understand comes from him. That brain is nothing but mush. But because of God, it is the greatest computer known to mankind. That I can tell my little finger to move and my foot to kick up at the same time. I can rub my belly and pat my head at the same time. Uh, My arms, my limbs, my muscles, they respond to this computer. It is only because of God. Nobody's plugged you in for your heart to beat. It is a beat. Every beat, thump, 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 is a beat from God. So who are you to come and say, God, if you'll do so-and-so, I'll do so-and-so. The book of protocol tells us, you enter into my gates with thanksgiving. You start coming to me, you're going to come through the gate. I, see, we got security, okay? Sometimes y'all get a little aggressive around me. You see uh, other people start coming around me. They're not here for prayer. They're going to say, you touch him, somebody's going to get an arm lock or something out there. Okay. And thank God because I've had some weird experiences. I thank God for that. And uh, so God, I believe, has got security guards, angels. And you come running. I'm going up to the throne, and I'm going to... Uh, uh, tell my complaints. God, you didn't come through for this. You didn't do that. You wouldn't show up here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, he just looks at him and said, you can take them out. Take them out. Not take them out like stop breathing, but... <laughs> he said, you want to come through my gates? Thanksgiving. You got to show me you're thankful for what I've done for you. You want to come even closer into my courts? You want to get right before me? There better be some praise on your lip. Well, I just wasn't brought up in my denomination to do it that way. So you're going to let your denomination keep you out of the presence of God. You're going to let your denomination drag your butt to hell? Come on. I'm talking about the Word. We're building on the Word. We're not building on somebody's denomination or somebody else's history. We're building on the Word. God said, you want to come to my, through my gate? You better come with thanksgiving. You want to come through my courts? You need to do it with praise. And you bless his name. So let me tell you what. This is the spiritual protocol he gives us. And he also shows us how to approach leaders, how to approach parents approaching their children, children approaching their parents, uh, friends and spouses, employers, employees. And you don't walk into your employer's office and say, you know, I've been here for 40 years and, and maybe probably made several million dollars in your salary. And yab, 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 yab. If you want something from that employer. 
you got to learn to say, I thank you that you've given me a job. However, I'm in a circumstance where I really need uh, to make more money. I don't want to leave because I believe in the vision of the company. Is there anything I can do extra or be trained in, uh, certified in, so I can make a bigger salary? I need to make more money. That's a whole different approach. And the Bible shows us how to do that. That leads me into number eight. The Word of God is a problem-solving handbook. It helps you solve any problem you have. I lost my key. In the great unknown. Oh, that song. Okay. Y'all remember that song? You remember it. Okay. I lost my key. I am a man of order. I put my keys where I always put my keys so that if the lights are out, I can find my keys in the dark. I put my Bible where I know I, I'm, just, I'm just that way. And because we did a baptism on Knott's Island last Saturday, not this Saturday, but last Saturday, and I had a change of clothes in my bag and all that stuff, I didn't want to get my keys wet. And uh, so I put my keys in my changing bag, which I've never done. And then when I changed and came home, the car would crank because the bag was in the car and I didn't think about it. And then I go and wash my clothes. And I thought I checked all the pockets, so, but then I can't find my key. So now I'm thinking I've washed the keys. That's, that that kind of key is probably a couple hundred dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to get another key. So I go through the washer and check my pants. No, there, there's no key. I look at my bag. It's turned upside down on a little bucket in the laundry room. There's no key. So I'm looking everywhere for my key. Why am I telling you this story? Because of number eight. The Word of God is a problem-solving handbook. And the Bible says that the Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So it's like, God, you know where my key is. I went to the Word. And your Word will show me each step to take to get to my key. The Holy Spirit, you're the author of this Word, so I'm listening now. I've tried, I've tried everything. I've looked everywhere. I'm listening now. I looked in the bag. I looked everywhere. And the Holy Spirit said, okay, now I've got your attention. Let me take you. Go upstairs. I go upstairs. Go in the laundry room. I started to say I've already been in here, but I, knew, I know better. It's so, okay. <laughs> Go in the laundry room. And, uh, and I'm thinking it's going to be in the vent or something in the wash drain or something other, you know. And uh, the Lord said, look at the bag. There's the bag laying upside down, open over a bucket to dry. And I'm like, I'm thinking I've already looked in the bag. He said, pick up the bag. I said, well, I've, okay, I picked up the bag. He said, now pull the bucket to you. So I pulled the bucket to him, and there was the key fell behind the bucket. And it was so close to it, I couldn't see it. Now, if God that is keeping the galaxies and the universe and everything in order, cares about a car key, a hair that falls off the head. He'll solve every problem you've got if you'll take it to him. Which takes me to number nine. It is a deliverance handbook for captives. Did you know the word of God is a deliverance handbook? Jesus said, I came. I am the Word. Jesus is the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with, you're with God. And the Word came and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word. Now the Word become flesh. Now the Word has become written to us. And this is Jesus' instructions to us by His Holy Spirit. So, I came to set the captives free. I came to liberate those who are in prison. If there's a demon control, influence, stronghold, oppression, Possession, you wouldn't be sitting in here if you were possessed because you'd probably be spitting up green soup and uh, head spinning around and need to be in the caves if you were possessed. But oppression, you don't have to live with that. The enemy will oppress your mind. Spirits will lie to you. Spirit of offense will tell you things that were never said, make you interpret things that never happened, make you interpret it in a way that it was against you when it really was for you. So, so you can be free by the word of God. Jesus rebuked the devil. Now, none of us have probably ever, I've never even met the devil. Some of you said, I married the devil. You better be careful talking like that. <laughs> you better be careful talking like that. I never met the devil. He's not omnipresent. He can't be all places at one time. He's one, singular, a fallen angel, Right? Now, God is omnipresent every place, all places at all times, but the devil's not. Now, the devil's got a horde of demons, fallen angels with him. I've dealt with some of those demons. I've dealt with demons, but I've never really faced the devil. Okay. 
I don't think. So Jesus was dealing with the devil. And he overcame him by the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. So this is our deliverance handbook. You get the word of God. And when the devil comes against you with his lie and his twisted half truth, you say, it is written and he will leave. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. John tells us uh, in 836, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus said, in my name you will cast out demons. James 4 says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the word is the handbook. He's telling us the sun set us free. If we're in Christ, we're not supposed to be living in bondage. In the name of Jesus, we can cast out devils and submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. That word flee, let me just give you a little, little Greek lesson here. If the Bible says you submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee, I want to know what that means. That word flee is fugo. Now that means a lot to you. It's from the root fuga in Greek. Now, that means even more to you, right? What does that fuga mean? Flight. It's the fuga, the word we get fugitive. Okay? Think of a fugitive. A fugitive is running and hiding, evading being captured. So when you get to the place that you learn what the manual says, that you submit yourself to God... There's an authority been given to you over all the power of the enemy. He knows now I'm not only going to leave you alone. I'm going to change my name. I'm going to get me a false driver's license. I'm going to move to another country. I'm going to try to evade you because you have authority. You know you have authority and I'm backing off. Now, when you start seeing it that way, you're going to live your life submitted to God every day. God, I submit to you. And when the devil comes, I can resist him and he will evade capture. He will flee. He will take flight. He will run and hide to avoid legal consequences. Hallelujah. And then finally, some of you just got Holy Ghost encouragement. He said, finally. We thought this was going to be a 20-point sermon. <laughs> I've been in 20-point sermons. I don't think I've ever preached one. The Word of God creates conviction that causes change. See, without conviction, you could live a whole lifetime in error without even moving towards God. I know I, I was there. Had it not been for the conviction that came through the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, again, all Scripture is given by inspiration or the breath of God, and it's profitable. It's not hindering, it's not hurting, it's profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that you, the man or woman of God, may be complete. See, God wants you to live to your full potential, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But it might be, well, we'll say this about your neighbor. It might be for the person sitting near you that they don't have complete insight into the ways of God and they've been doing things their own way. I know it's not true of you, but maybe your neighbor. And they are obstinate and rejecting any counsel from man. But I'm telling you, when you get in the Word of God, the Word of God has the power. The breath of God, the anointing of God's Word has the power. One scripture can bring reproof, correction, instruction in doing it the right way. Whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in parenting, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in business, whether it's uh, in the marketplace, wherever with friends, one word from God can change everything. Everything, everything. Only the Word of God can do that. Arguments of man cannot. Hebrews 4 and 12 said, for the, this is where we started, so we end here. For the Word of God is living. That's why it can do it. It's active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It can get through all the crust that experiences and letdowns and disappointments have caused you. It can get in like a scaffold, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Why does it say division of soul and spirit? 
Because if you live by the soul, your emotions that are touched and changed by the experiences and circumstances around you, you can be all giddy-eyed and happy one minute and all depressed the next minute. Your soul is like a tempest sea. Your memories, you can remember something and, and go from happy to sad or sad to happy. It is very, very volatile. You cannot build and live. You're made to be a soulish person, but you're not to walk by that. You're to walk by the Spirit. And the Word speaks to the soul and says, this is temporary. Go ahead and give a good cry. It's okay, have a good cry. But we're not going to make life-changing decisions from this temporary challenge. So just have your cry. But here's what I say to you, Spirit, stand strong. You're coming under opposition because the devil doesn't want you to move in this direction. You don't come, you know, like us, go into Africa. And it's like Caleb was number one saying, I know God's called me when I just put out the call. He said, God's called me to go to Africa. And guess what I got to do after the service today? And we leave on Wednesday. I got to go to D.C. So that first thing in the morning, we're there. They wouldn't give us an appointment until it was that close to us leaving to get his passport renewed because we didn't realize kids' passports only are five years when everybody else's is 10 because they go from little baby face to a little grown-up face and they need that updated. We didn't know that. And then when we did, they said, we can't help you until you're within two weeks of leaving. We called and said, we can't book you until two days before you leave. I said, boy, government really knows how to put you, get on your nerves, Okay. So we're like, Caleb, do you want to go next time? He said, no, God told me to go. Now, if we were soulish, we would say, this is too much. This waiting and no, not knowing if they will give us an appointment. One lady told us, you may get an appointment in Hawaii. Said our last client that needed it had to go to Hawaii. That was the only uh, uh, opening to get it. The one before that had to go to Texas. So that's what we're living with as we're moving up till the day they would even give us an appointment, which then they gave it to us, D.C., two days before we leave. Then a visa has to be gotten from Kenya once you have your passport updated. And all the team of seven are approved, and it took some of us over a month to get approved. And we're going to get it the day, the two days before, day and a half before, to get a visa. Now, if the word was not coming in and separating soul and spirit, it would have been so much easier to say, next trip, next trip. The devil, I mean, uh, God doesn't want, this is what soul would have said, the, us religious folks, you know. Well, God, there's opposition, so God must don't want us to go. That sounds real spiritual. Man, we just, we're a little ahead of God. We're out of the timing of God. Opposition may mean that you're supposed to be going. But you let the word separate the soul from the spirit. And every time I would talk to Caleb and I would pray about it and, and mom would pray about it, we always got this confirmation he's supposed to be there. And that was in our spirit, even though much easier to say next time. Not just giving you that as an example of how soul and spirit being separated, joint and marrow, that's where the very formation of your cellular structure and your blood is made in the joint and the marrow. That means every system in your body that feeds from that uh, for health or in sickness, it, the word can get into the joint. It can change your blood. It can change your cellular structure. It doesn't come from the without to come against the sickness. It gets into the bone and the marrow. The word gets into the bone and the marrow. So your blood is no longer producing, your marrow is no longer producing bad blood cells. It's producing holy ghost supercharged blood cells that goes to every organ in every system and revitalizes it for God. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Let the word of God convict you today. Let the Word of God speak to you today. And say, you know what? It's already two minutes after the hour. We usually get out of here at one. That's my thoughts. No, nope. the Word of God says what we're dealing with right now is more important than that time. We're dealing with my heart, my attitude, my commitment, and my life in Christ. Whether eternity is mine or not. I know you can smile and be kind to five people before you die, having lived the whole life of being a hoodlum, and, and people can get up and preach into heaven. That don't mean you're in heaven. Do you hear me? That doesn't mean you're in heaven. 
Just because they get up and preach you in heaven, that don't mean you're in heaven. Heaven's a reality. Hell's a reality. I want this. This here. What did he say? He says to the prophet, what is that in my hand? What is that? Plumb line. He said, my word is the plumb line. Build by it and you'll be right with God. So I want to be instructed by this. That means I can't have any other gods before him. That means I can't even be the Lord of my own life. That I've got to dethrone me and enthrone him. Because if he's not Lord over all, he's not Lord at all. So let the word speak to you. Is Jesus Christ Lord over all? Right now, if he's not, you need to repent. You need to ask God for forgiveness. And you need to do some reshuffling who's in charge of your life. I can't do that for you, but I can give you this opportunity in prayer to do that now. Would you stand with me? Some of you may feel that you need to come to the altar to do this. I tell you what, I always found that was more meaningful to me and I think more meaningful to God. I just come to the altar and say, Lord God, I'm coming to this altar and I'm, I'm, I'm yielding to you. Maybe every area but one was in his control. And that one thing the Holy Spirit, by the word, just showed you is not in his control. I'm going to get it all. I want it all. Like when I baptize folks, I get them wet all the way. I take them all the way under. That's lordship. I want my life totally surrendered. Is there an area of your life right now that you need to bring to the altar of God? Let the Holy Spirit and the word convict you to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart so that you leave here today knowing, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt for me to live is Christ. Therefore, for me to die is gain. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the work you're doing around this altar right now. Thank you, Lord God, that you're willing to take us at any time that we're willing to surrender, that we're willing to submit, that we're willing to yield our lives to you. Thank you for always having your door open. Thank you. Now we know the day will come, as you told us with the rich man in Lazarus, that we will either be in hell or heaven, and there is no going between. But God, until that day, we can repent. Until that day, we can change. Until that day, we can surrender, and we can find grace and mercy at the foot of the cross. So, Lord, I pray by your word as you bring conviction to us this day, if there's anything out of order in our life, Lord God, if there's any area of our life that is not surrendered, but we want it to come under your ordering and to be surrendered to you, Lord, we just come. We just come. We come to this altar. And, Lord God, we ask you, God, for your forgiveness, Lord. We ask you, God, Lord, for you to come in and cleanse us, renew us, direct us, show us the step, the next step that we need to take is your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord God, that we'll walk out of here today walking in your word and walking in the power thereof, knowing that you can take us higher, you can take us to the next level, you can build upon us because we are founded on the word of God. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we pray. Now, God, I pray that you would fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Lord, your spirit is the life. Your spirit is the light. Your spirit is the power. Your spirit is the anointing that we can live this life that we've committed to live. So, Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit that wrote this word. Holy Spirit that just spoke to us. Holy Spirit that convicted us. Now, Holy Spirit, fill us afresh and anew. Fill every part of me. Fill the whole house. Let that be your prayer. God, fill this whole house with your spirit. Fill me, Lord God, my mind. Fill my heart. Fill my limbs. Fill my life. Fill every organ. Fill every system. Fill me, Lord God. Fill me, Lord God, with your spirit. Lord, that I can rise up out of here walking in the anointing, uh, talking in the anointing, living in the anointing, the anointing that lifts the burdens and destroys the yokes. Lord God, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Submit yourself to God. 
Then you resist the devil. Come on now. You've submitted. Now resist the devil. Resist the devil. Make him a fugitive. Make him change his identity. Make him fly to another country. Make him leave, run, and hide from you and your family. Resist the devil. And he will flee. I just hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, just to show you my presence and my power through your yieldedness, I'm showing you healing. There's healing flowing right now. Somebody that needs healing, just say, that's for me. I receive it. I receive it. He said, I'm, I'm flo- you've, you've just unlocked, you've just opened the gate. You've had that floodgate shut. You've just opened the gate for healing to flow. Just say, I receive it, Lord God. I receive that healing in my mind, in my heart, in my body, in my life, and in, in, in every area, my relationships, my finances, wherever the healing, I receive it, Lord. I receive it. The gates are open. There's a river flowing from the throne of God. And on the banks of the river, trees that have leaves all year round and there's healing for the nations in the leaves. He said, I'm bringing healing to the nations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for every nation represented here today. God, bring healing to the nations, to your people, God. And Lord God, I just pray that those difficult situations that some people came in here facing, that they'll go out of here looking at it. Wait a minute. I now have the divine instruction manual of God and how to deal with it. And that's what I'm going to rely on. So, Lord God, I want to thank you in advance for the victory because you never lose, for the advancement because you never digress, digress. And, Lord God, for your blessings that are going to come on your people. Now, God, I pray for protection on each and every one here. And, Lord God, on our team that is going to Africa this Wednesday. Lord God, I pray for Terrence, Lord God, that his household would be blessed as they are releasing him to go with us, Lord God, as an armor bearer in ministry, Lord God. Lord, for Michael Carr, Lord God, a blessing on his household as they're releasing him to go and to do ministry here in Africa, Lord. Lord God, we pray for Michael Hodges and his daughter Ava, Lord God, as their household would be blessed by you as they're released to go and to do ministry here, Lord God. And Lord God, for Megan Wickeiser, Lord God, for her household to be blessed as she's released to go with us and to do ministry here, Lord God. And Lord God, we just pray for for Townsend and Caleb and myself, Lord God. Lord, that our household, our physical household at the house and this household, your church, would be blessed and protected, Lord God, as they release us to go and do this ministry. And Lord God, you would anoint us that we would go in your power. We would go in your might. We would go in your favor. We would go, Lord God, that we would stand against the strongholds victoriously, Lord God, stand on your word and in your spirit and the power thereof. Lord God, I pray that those pastors and those leaders and those church members and those delegates from those nations that coming together, Lord God, Lord, whether it be a thousand or two thousand, Lord God, that they would be receptive and receive uh, not from us as man, but from you from heaven through us, Lord. Lord, that lives would be changed, that they would be trained and taught, that when they go back into their pulpits, that they'll be able to take their congregations to the next level. Those families, Lord God, that will be the uh, thousands of thousands of families, Lord, that their lives would go to the next level. Because, Lord God, you're sending us on this. We thank you for making a way. We thank you, Lord God, for your favor. Now, God, I pray that you would bless each and every one as we go into this day, this week, as we go, being led by your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, give God a big hand. He's a good guy. Love on one another. Shake somebody's hand. Bless one another. And let's just go forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.